What is something big I have purchased and didn't discuss with you first? Um, I don't think there's anything that you've purchased that you didn't discuss with me first. But I do remember a time when we were dating, we ended up going, I take, taking you to Putt Putt Golf. And you were like, what are we doing here? You're like, I don't, this isn't what I do. I don't want to go play Putt Putt Golf. And I just like, just like, all right, what, what do you want to do? But Yeah, well, he didn't discuss that with me <laughs> first. <laughs> but um, maybe like, I think something that you didn't dis well maybe you discussed it with me but I didn't approve of it was a bike you bought motorcycle so it was discussed but not approved yeah not because yeah. I'm bossy because <laughs> safety yeah that's what she says but it's not about safety <laughs> all right Good morning again. I am AJ. If you don't know me, I'm the campus pastor here at Renewal Church Highlands, and it's great to be with you in worship this morning. Today we are concluding our Marriage Matters sermon series and talking about finances. Uh, finances, it's something that has a tendency to create stress uh, because, uh, I mean, we, we never seem to have or we always want to have more, and sometimes we don't seem to have enough. Um, and before we kind of dive into kind of finances in general, I wanted to kind of single out debt in particular and talk a little bit uh, about debt. Uh, debt is something that just has the incredible power uh, to create stress in our lives, and the amount of debt out there is incredible. If you check out some of these stats uh, from last year, uh, you can see that you know, the average household in the United States had about $135,000 in debt, right, total debt. Um, you know, probably the most, some of the most concerning of that would be credit cards, revolving credit cards, is that most families lived with almost a $7,000 balance on their credit card that wasn't paid off. That's a revolving balance, right? So that's interest accruing, uh, crushing debt, right? Um, last year, 26% of Americans, um, on the next slide, actually uh, had to have, 26% uh, of Americans' income had to be given back to consumer debt lenders, right? Uh, and so, um, we're giving a significant portion of what we get, we're turning it right back around and giving it to debt lenders as interest payments and so forth, right? Um, have you ever spent money on something that you regretted? There's a few people out there, right? Have you ever stressed about money? Where are my people at, right? <laughs> this should be just about everybody, right? Um, death, or debt, excuse me, debt, uh, both monetary and spiritual debt, has a crushing power, right, that squashes out life. Um, in Scripture, in the Old Testament, there is a book uh, called Hosea. And this is a picture of Hosea and his wife. Hi, guys. Uh, actual picture from the day. Um, but in, in Scripture, there is this book called Hosea. And it's pretty short, uh, but there's a really, it's kind of an odd tale that uh, God is sort of a picture of his love for his people and for the church. Uh, he tells the prophet Hosea to go and marry a promiscuous and unfaithful wife. Uh, which, like, uh, you know, it's kind of odd, right? Uh, but Hosea, and it's sort of a picture of how much God, love God has for us, and he does it, right? And they have a family, and they have children, right? But um, before long, she leaves him. Um, and she goes, and she, she finds another man. She, she goes after her, her old habits, right? And uh, her name is Gomer. And, uh, you know, Gomer gets herself into trouble, um, and uh, Hosea and his family, they, they want her back, but she's out there, uh, she's being unfaithful, and she gets herself into trouble, uh, and eventually it seems like she winds up um, in prostitution or in indentured servitude, perhaps because of a debt that she had accumulated, uh, and she sort of sells herself to that, right? And Gomer personifies our spiritual condition. Um, that though we have a creator, a God who loves us, um, who uh, scripture says is like a husband to us, that's the closeness of the relationship we're to have with God, that we often run after other things. And, and we run after other things that we think, you know, will give us personal gratification, or we run after stuff, or we run after uh, experiences even, and right, oftentimes we run after things that look really good, but they have a dark side that we're ignorant of. They have consequences that we only see till later, right? And we think we're living sort of the spontaneous and the fun life, right, and seizing life uh, for ourselves when often whatever we seek, uh, if it's not in God, if it's instead of God, if it's intended to be in the place of God, uh, that those things are actually harmful uh, for us, right? And a rejection uh, of God is always, a rejection of our creator uh, is not helpful or good, right? Um, 
God's word describes our rejection of God, our pursuing of a false identity, security, or meaning in things apart from him as sin. And scripture throughout, one theme that we see throughout the story of scripture is that sin is equated to debt. It's, it's like when we sin, uh, there is a, a sort of an accumulation that started to go on, right? You know, you toss another one in the debt pile, right? And that our sin, our evil, if you want to call it that, um, it sort of creates a massive debt problem that we're unable to solve on our own. It's almost like a, a runaway interest payment uh, that just keeps going and going and going and going. Uh, and we're unable to get out from under that on our own. And it sort of enslaves us, much like the proverb uh, in Proverbs 22, which says that the borrower is slave to the lender. It's almost like we're, we're taking, 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 lending, right? And, and, but it's enslaving us further, that sin has a way of doing that to us, that when we do things that are contrary uh, to God's will, to things that harm our relationship with God or our relationship with others uh, or even damage this world, right, that we end up enslaved to sin. And, and Romans says that nobody is immune, right, not me, not you, sadly, right, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And yet, uh, much like in the story, uh, so in the story of Hosea and with his wife Gomer, uh, Hosea, like God, he still loves and values his wife. And so he goes, he finds her, he seeks her out. Um, we don't know exactly what her situation was, but it says in Scripture that he actually has to buy her back uh, from some sort of indentured servitude or, or something, right? Uh, and he has to purchase her back. And the whole redemption language is sort of a language that implies, it, it makes us think of a monetary transaction almost, right? Um, and in the same way, God loves us too. That even though it's totally our far fault, we've gotten ourselves in this midst of debt, a, a spiritual debt uh, to sin, uh, that he desires to win us back. We have incredible value and worth that he has given us because we are creatures of God created uh, in his image. And so uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says it this way. It says, you know about the kindness of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was rich, yet for your sake he became poor in order to make you rich through his poverty. And so Jesus, uh, God in the flesh, he comes down and is incarnate for us. God uh, actively seeks us out, actively comes to us uh, in our slavery to sin uh, and empties the, the treasury of heaven, right? He who brings the full greatness and riches of God uh, brings them for us and exchanges them for us. Uh, that Jesus, though he is God in the flesh, though he is rich, he exchanges that and becomes poor uh, in order to redeem us from sin. And so there's uh, this incredible debt and weight lifted off of our shoulders. We're a people that's been redeemed, that's been set apart uh, in God. Uh, don't jump the gun on me too much up there. Thanks, though. Um, and we're absolutely a people um, that has much to be thankful for, uh, that has... Um, sort of a new God-given life uh, that we have been appointed to through the forgiveness of sins. That when Jesus goes to the cross and dies for us, uh, that it is um, as if it is uh, as an incredible payment for sin to redeem and spring God's people free. And yes, we do come together today as a grateful people. Um, being God's redeemed people also means looking at life totally differently, looking at our finances totally differently. Um, it means a couple things here that we're going to go through today. Uh, it means making some worldview changes, that the people of God, because of their nature as being redeemed through the work of Jesus, um, have been given a new identity uh, and a new worldview from God to be adopted. Uh, and often this contrasts with the way that we may have seen things before. Uh, for example, um, you know, from understanding that life is our story uh, to suddenly understanding that no life is God's story it's not about us it's absolutely about him in scripture uh, it, it is all about what God is doing in history and our story yes fits inside of that but we can't go to scripture and say this is all about me it's absolutely about God right um, from thinking that other people owe me something which maybe they do but God calls us to forgive uh, just as we have been forgiven. There's this great parable of the unmerciful servant where uh, the servant is forgiven a great debt and then they turn right around and they find someone else who owns, owes them money and they start choking them and they're like, where's my money? Pay me back what you owe. 
right? And how often do we do that? We, we receive grace from God or even from other people, and we don't often, sometimes don't return it to others. And yet instead of holding grudges or, uh, you know, whatever we have against people, we're called to forgive as we've been forgiven. Um, to make a worldview change from understanding that the stuff that we have uh, belongs to me, it's mine, I earned it, uh, to instead that I am God's servant, uh, entrusted with his gifts to use for his purposes. And whatever we, we've been given, whether it's money, whether it's stuff, whether it's a family, whatever it is, uh, that we've been given that and entrusted to use that in a faithful way. There's a great parable in scripture, again, called the parable of the talents or the minas. It, it seems like Jesus told it multiple different occasions, and sometimes he changed the details, but the point was the same, that God uh, gives us, um, you know, whatever we have to use for his glory. It's not ours, that we're like a servant that when God comes back, needs to prove faithful what, with what we've been given. Um, from understanding that I must save money in order to gain security and comfort in this life to instead making a worldview switch to I must store up treasures in heaven. Where my treasure is, there my heart is, right? And so I should store up treasures in heaven, which is what those passages say. Um, that we have to make a switch in our priorities, in our worldview, in our thinking, in order to understand uh, truly to, to live in the gospel, but also understand uh, how God desires for us to handle money and finances. In marriage, uh, God designed husband and wife to come together as one flesh and to ally with one another around faith, sex, communication, power, parenting, and money. That's what we've been talking about in this series. Um, and truth be told, you know, in terms of scriptural principles, whether you're single or married, the scriptural principles of how to handle money God's way are, are very much the same. But when you are married and you getting two people to agree together on family finances and goals and that sort of thing can be an incredible challenge. Um, there are spenders and savers in this world. Uh, who here is a spender? Where, where are my people at? I'm with you guys out here, spenders, right? I know where I'm at uh, here, uh, you know, uh, God bless Megan. Uh, but, you know, spenders uh, can be hard to deal with sometimes, right? Because they have big eyes, they have big vision, right? Uh, and they often um, live not necessarily in the concrete, but are like, man, it'll be, be okay. Uh, you know, whatever, we'll make it work somehow, right? Uh, where are the savers at? We got some savers in here. We have some thermostat controlling. I still have my XYZ from 20 years ago that barely works, but I'm using it type of savers in here, right? Um, that we've got people in here uh, that, you know, we need, to, we need to stash some stuff away for a rainy day, right? Um, and often, spenders and savers uh, marry each other, and that's hard to marry, uh, so to speak. Uh, I remember one time with Megan and I, um, a particular argument that involved French fries, um, which probably doesn't surprise you knowing me, right? But uh, I try to eat well. But um, no, I remember one time we had kind of talked together and, and we we're like, you know, we need to save money, right? And we, we talked about, yeah, okay, we're going to save money. And that was kind of the end of the conversation. And so like we're shopping at Walmart together and, you know, they've got the impulse buy stores at the front and all that, right? And uh, I, I remember like, I'm just going to get some fries, you know, so that we can I'm just going to enjoy a snack as we walk around, right? And, like, I think the whole time Megan was probably simmering, um, but uh, starting to stew, you know. And, and finally, we kind of had it out over French fries, right? Um, and, and it just seemed like this, this really silly argument, right? But the reality is, uh, to her, we're going to save meant uh, we're not going to do fast food, right? And to me, we're going to save didn't mean that you couldn't necessarily treat yourself on occasion. And... We didn't actually talk about what I, either one of us meant <laughs> when it came to uh, that statement of we're going we're to save money, right? And that often uh, with, with couples, um, we're not as intentional, we're not as uh, explicit, we're not as, as detailed about our communication uh, around money as we need to be. And so kind of the question is, what are the, some of the things that we can do to get ourselves on the same page about money? Because uh, our desire is to ally together, right, to be unified, to be one flesh, to proceed uh, in unison together, and to have our, our goals be the same, right? So how can we get on the same page about money? There's a couple of um, practical things that we can do. 
Uh, first and foremost, right, uh, a warning about separate finances. If you enter into marriage uh, with a desire to do pre- prenups or keep your finances separate, uh, separate bank accounts or whatever, um, if the goal of that is to hedge your bets, is to provide yourself an option maybe for later, uh, or to uh, promote secret spending, those things are going to be harmful to the relationship, right? Which leads me to the next point, which is secret spending is a no-no, right? Uh, or, or a surprise spending that's not reasonable. So Jeff Foxworthy had this great bit on, on one of his um, stand-ups uh, where, you know, it's like the, uh, the wife sleeps in that day and then wakes up and there's a new bass boat in the driveway and he's like, it was your turn to sleep in, honey, <laughs> you know, right? That we don't do this, that sort of spending. We don't do secret spending. We desire to ally together. Um, and if our sinful nature is causing us to want to do secret spending, or if we've done that already, uh, then to be honest, to open up and repent of that and desire to get on the same page, right? Um, and to actually talk about money together. Um, often, we kind of in marriage, we kind of divvy up responsibilities. Um, and sometimes the finances kind of just falls to the organized person, um, and which you'll never guess who that is in my relationship. But, uh, you know, and our tendency is to kind of silo off and that person does the finances. And we don't really talk about them in a unified way. Um, it's important to, to gather together, to have those conversations, even if one person does the majority of the bookkeeping, uh, to make sure you're having conversations about where you're at uh, and what your financial goals are. And actually have financial goals. That's the next one. Uh, is to actually talk about um, how can we not just survive, but how do, how do we get where we want to go? And where is it that we want to go? And kind of talk about those things together, right? The vast majority of this is essentially comes down to talking about it with one another, right? Uh, to talk about your spending limits. You know, for example, how much can you spend without talking to your spouse? You know, is, is it 50 bucks? Is it 100 bucks? What is it, right? Uh, and are you guys on the same page about that? It'd be a fun conversation on the ride home is, uh, what are, are those limits? What's, what's been understood? Um, to explore generosity together. Uh, generosity is really an important thing. Uh, scripture has a lot to say about money in general, but also about generosity. Um, in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 5, it says, There is a painful tragedy that I have seen under the sun, that riches lead to the downfall of those who hoard them. Interesting quote, right? And by the way, Ecclesiastes was featured in this week's uh, Scripture on the Go podcast, if you want more on that. Um, but there is a truth in Scripture that when we hoard uh, when we just have the closed fist around money, we end up uh, in a spot that's harmful to us uh, because it shows that our heart is not in the right place, right? Uh, right? That um, it, it shows that we have this idea that it, money brings me some sort of security and comfort and meaning that I need to latch onto, right? That I really need to, um, you know, I can't let it go because it directly equates to my happiness or my security, right? And, and it's, we're ascribing to money what we should be ascribing to God. Um, and so when we have the closed fist and we're not being generous, it can be harmful to um, you know, our health in general, right? Um, giving is first and foremost about worship. Uh, giving is, is something that God uses to train our hearts, uh, to help teach us, uh, to help us understand that money is not all... Uh, Everything in this world is not all it's cracked up to be. It's not your savior. Uh, it shouldn't be your fun or, or whatever else, right? But that money uh, is absolutely a, a tool. Uh, but the reality is when we give some of it away, it helps us to recognize, first and foremost, that it was God's to begin with. Um, uh, don't jump too far ahead of me, please. Uh, that it was God's to begin with, uh, and it's ours that we're entrusted with, and so we're supposed to be using it on the things that glorify him. When we give some of it away, we're saying, money is not my God. We're actually acknowledging God's lordship over our lives and that he is the ultimate provider in our life. And so generosity is incredibly important um, as an act of worship. And then secondarily, as something that provides for, uh, you know, good nonprofits and, and chiefly the ministry of the gospel through the organized church to go forward. Um, but primarily and first and foremost about worship. Um, and truly people, I, I think if you talk to anyone in here who, who gives, uh, you know, that they'll describe it not as something that pains them, but often it's something that brings people incredible joy, right? They get uh, to a point where they realize that what it's done in their hearts and, and what they get to participate in through generosity uh, is an incredible thing. And so I uh, encourage you guys, um, not to wait to be generous until you're in uh, a perfect financial spot because then we'll never get there. We'll keep moving the bar up. 
but instead to experience the joy of generosity sooner than later and to be on the same page uh, with your spouse about that. Uh, Also, um, as we move on to the next in the list of um, how can we get on the same page, Financial Peace University is a great way to sort of take this conversation further and get a little bit more nitty-gritty with the details around um, what what are some good habits and practices in finances. Uh, I'd like to check out this video for kind of a brief promo on that. Hi, I'm Chris Hogan. Have you ever done something stupid with money? I know I have. I mean, when I was in my 20s, I wanted people to think I was successful. I got caught up in trying to keep up with the Joneses. So I got the bank to loan me money because, of course, I didn't have any, and I went out and bought a Ford Expedition. I know, not the car you'd necessarily choose. I made $600 car payments every month for almost five years to own a hunk of metal. Thinking about that car hurts. You know what I'm talking about. Because if it's not a car payment, it's a credit card bill, or maybe even a student loan. No matter how you spend it, you owe your income to someone else. But what if you could invest that payment for your future? You'd be able to retire with wealth and dignity. You'd leave a legacy for generations to come. Wow. Or how about this one? What if you could give that payment to a single mom who's struggling to get by? What if you could give it to your church? You see, debt is a thief. It steals your joy. It steals your freedom, and it keeps you from living the life God wants for you. And if you're ready to get out of debt, save and invest, and make giving a part of your daily life, it's time to make a change. And Financial Peace University can help. Over five million people have already been through this program, and they've learned God's ways of handling money. And now, you can too. All right, so Financial Peace University, a great way to sort of uh, get some more financial education and be on the same page. It forces a lot of conversation. So even though it's not a, a perfect program, hi, and you may, I, oh, uh, hi. Uh, you may not do everything in the program, but it forces a lot of great conversation. And they always talk about this too, how the average family who completes the class will pay off a ton of debt and save a bunch of money. Uh, even within that first three months after the class. So I highly encourage that. We actually are kicking off a Financial Peace University class here uh, July 9th. Uh, Our own Woody and Stan are going to be leading that class, um, which that sounds like a great band name, you know, it's like a bluegrass band. So, um, you know, they should really, you guys should start making music. But uh, truly, we're grateful for them for for leading the class. That'll be Tuesday nights at 630, and there uh, will be child care as well. So really encourage you guys to to be a part of this, and Renewal will even give you a little $20 uh, rebate for participating in that as our way of just encouraging you to be a part of it. Um, but truly today, I think the, the, our desire that, and our heart that we got from Scripture is to be allied and united as the body of Christ around this idea that our identity, security, and meaning come from Jesus and come from being his redeemed people, that he has gone to the cross for, that he has died for, that he has paid for in order to uh, make us rich through faith and to shower the blessings and the riches of heaven upon us. Uh, And so truly, uh, today is a day to focus on uh, we've had a great debt and burden lifted. And if you're on the fence about Jesus, uh, he would love to take your debt and replace it with joy as well. And if you want to talk more about that, we have a great Next Steps coming up, uh, class coming up uh, June 9th, Sunday, June 9th. Um, But truly, we've had a debt lifted. And because of that, when it comes to finances, and particularly in marriage, we approach them differently. Uh, We approach them as people who have a worldview, not uh, of our own, uh, but instead that we adopt the worldview of our Savior, of our Master, who uh, rules us not as a a harsh Master, but benevolently. uh, He cares for us, and we serve Him out of joy. Um, Paul Kretzmann had this great comment on the the second Corinthians passage. Uh, He says, The rich Lord of heaven, the possessor of the fullness of divine glory and of the abundance of all treasures, became poor, denied himself the use and enjoyment of even ordinary prosperity, and lived all his life in the depths of poverty. But incidentally, he poured out upon us the full measure of the spiritual riches in heavenly places, giving us all the more of spiritual treasures as he lacked earthly treasures. With such an example of supreme self-sacrifice before their eyes at all times, what can the Christians of all time do but strive with all the spiritual power at their command to emulate the great example and to follow in the footsteps of their great Lord? Today as we go, we go remembering that we are a redeemed and exchanged people and we are a grateful people. And we go forward to take that same redemption that we have received 
and connect others to that great lifting of debt through Jesus, uh, through our words and actions. We pray.